Hey, welcome to Our City Church. I am so glad to have you today. My name is Chris, if we haven't met yet, I'm the lead pastor around here and I welcome you from wherever you're watching, in your home, uh, on your phone, a tablet, on your TV. Just thanks so much for being here today. And again, we celebrate and honor, uh, happy Memorial Day to you as, as we do this together. As we celebrate, we honor uh, all of those that have given their lives uh, for our freedom. It is such a special weekend for us to really take that into memory. And so uh, blessings to you and your family, wherever you are, as you rest and uh, really hopefully take that in to your heart this weekend. I, I want to say to you, if you're new to our city church or just new in general, the church, you're just kind of coming back and church hasn't really been your thing for a long time. And, you know, God and Jesus have always been things that you've known about or heard about, but you weren't sure about, or maybe you used to go to church and somebody invited you, said, you got to check out our city. It's a little different. Uh, we are a little different. You'll figure that out here pretty soon. But I, I want to let you know you're welcome here. And I want to make sure you know, you, you don't have to believe what we believe to belong here, okay? We, we want you to come and learn about the things that we're passionate about. We want you to learn about Jesus and, and his love for you. And you don't have to have all that figured out. You don't have to have that all dialed in. And you don't have to believe it all like we believe. I didn't always believe the stuff I believe. And so we make space at Our City Church for the journey of everyone wherever they're at. And we're honored and glad that you're here today. And we wanna make sure you know that. I do wanna say that if you are a part of our community and you, know, you are a follower of Jesus as I am, uh, I'm excited to share God's word with you. Uh, uh, we, we, we love the Bible here. I am a Bible guy. I am a Jesus guy. I love Jesus. And it is my desire to help him make sense to you and make the Bible make sense to you today. So if you do have a Bible, I want to invite you to open it up to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to continue our discussion. We started last week uh, talking about the first words of God in the Bible. But today we're going to talk about someone else's first words. And we're going to discuss that and the implications for our lives. And I, I really believe that today is going to be life changing for so many of you. And it's going to make things, I think, add up and kind of make sense and go, oh my gosh, that, that's me. He's talking about me. And that's God's way of, I think, speaking through a sermon, a message, a talk, so that your heart is, is beginning to resonate with what he's trying to communicate. And I hope that happens uh, for you today. Uh, to kind of discuss like and set up what I, I believe we want to talk about today, um, I, I want you to consider, those of you that have had to do the following things, uh, if you've had to have your kids in the house more than normal, they were usually going to school or now they're home, there's a few different things that are probably happening that are not normal and I want to touch on one. And for those of you that are working and you are doing a ton of work from home and now uh, Zoom used to be something that you you know thought only a car does and now or some like old commercial Zoom Zoom, like it's not that anymore. Now it's like something that means this is how I connect to my job, to the people I work with or potential clients or customers customers or the people that I'm in community with at my church uh, in a life group. I know our, our community, so many of us are in a life group where we've met on Zoom. And one of the things, there's two things I've noticed. Number one, about being at home. I, th I think all of us could say our kids have probably seen us be on our phones as much as we have complained often that our kids who have phones are on their phones, right? And that's not normal because usually you're allowed to be on your phone when they're at school. And so you're allowed to kind of like do whatever you do and, and kind of be on it. But now it's like almost, especially have young kids who went to school, but now they're home. It's so easy to set back into a habit where I know for me, we've, we've got Eliana, she's four. I started to notice that she's more aware or almost expecting uh, me to be on my phone. And I was looking at it this, this last week and I thought, you know, she's playing, her voice is being heard by my ears. I know she's doing her thing, but sometimes I've been on my phone. I've been watching it, looking at it, and it's this different thing that's taking place where I'm present, I'm there, but I'm not really listening to her voice. I'm listening to whatever's going on on my phone. And I've realized like, man, my daughter is like watching me think that someone else or even just what my phone is showing me is more important than whatever she's doing. I'm present, I'm there, and I'm, you know, doing a good job, I think, of trying to like interact with her. But the reality is I'm definitely communicating this matters more than whatever you're doing right there. And it's accidental. I don't intend for it to be, but it's something I've noticed uh, just in this last week. And I'm like, man, I, God, I need to get better at that. That is a that's a that's an introduction of something that is not better about this season of quarantine and me being home in times I'm not normally home. Usually on Sundays, I am, you know, preaching.
speaking on a stage or I'm walking the hallways or I'm doing all I can to try to connect with you guys. And uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be in my home. I'm not gonna be out and about and we're gonna be more like available. I'm not in my life group on Sunday evenings. So I'm home more often in the afternoons and evenings on Sundays and it's kind of like this space where I'm not used to managing it. Not only that, but Zoom is something else I noticed. Now I'm gonna be super honest. I don't know if you've noticed this. Have you noticed, those of you that are using Zoom, have you noticed how much, no matter who's talking on Zoom, you are looking at your face? Does anyone else do this? Like, I don't know about you, but like, it doesn't matter who's talking. I noticed that like, I will stare. I didn't know how much I wanted to look at my face, number one. Number two, I didn't know what my face did. My face does things that I did not know that it does. It makes faces, it has creases in eyebrows, and like, there's certain things I do where I raise my eyebrows, and other things I'm just like, when I'm thinking, but I'm looking like this, I'm like, man, I look so mad right now. To the rest of the world, I had no idea that when I was listening intently to you, and kind of trying to decide what I thought, that I was just like this creepy, in my and like some of you do it you don't know you do it well you didn't know until zoom happened and now you're like oh my gosh my face does that so I just want to introduce you to the ideas that often we're on zoom or we're at home and there are other people talking their voice is speaking it's present we're around it but something else has caught our attention something else we're paying attention to something else we're leaning into and there's a disconnect going on and I, I want to talk about that today. And I want to even talk about um, really a deep place in all of our hearts and in, in all of our natures. What I believe is in our created nature um, is a part of our born nature, rather not created nature, but our born nature, that how we're born into this, this thing inside of us. I want to talk about where I think some of that comes from and, and what we're doing to try to deal with that. And I believe it actually goes all the way back to where we started last week, which is in the original story, in the very first thing that we read in the Bible. And last week, by the way, if you're watching this on replay, if you're live, keep, stay with me. But if you're watching this on replay, uh, I want you to do me a favor. If, if you're listening to this on our podcast, uh, pause right now and go back and listen to last week's message. Because I think last week's message is so important to set this up. Because we talked about God's first words, okay? And his first words were, let there be light. But the implications of that message really matter for where I'm about to take the rest of us today. And it won't make much sense, honestly, where I want to take today's message where I believe God wants to speak to us as a church community and as a global community, unless we understand why God's first words were what they were and what they spoke to. What was the dynamics? What was the setting? How did that uh, set us up for where we're at? Because today I don't want to talk about God's first words, but I actually want to go in and I want to talk about the idea of the voice that then gets introduced after God's voice, which is right after God gets done creating mankind, the very first words that we hear from the adversary or the enemy, and in the Bible his name is Satan, Satan's first words. I want to talk about that. Now that's not probably something that like you all tuned in today to hear, but follow me. Even if you're not a believer, the reality is today that we all believe in, if you don't believe in a God and a Satan, you definitely believe in a good and an evil, okay? There's goodness you see and there's evil you see and you identify that. So even if you're not like a, you know, you don't believe in God and Satan or the Bible or Jesus and all, that's fine. You can still get something out of today and I want you to lean in because I want to talk about the nature that is inside of you and inside of me. And if you're an honest person, you would admit, even if you don't think it came from the cosmos or it's a war between God and Satan, you would at least be honest enough to admit, if you're an honest person, that it lives in you. It lives in me, that it's a part of the brokenness inside of all of us to have this like darker side of of stuff that's like wrong or broken or 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 uniquely selfish and i want to talk about where that came from and where that voice begins to speak i want to literally lean into the bible's first recorded words of the very first words that Satan ever utters and, and talk a little bit about it. Because what we're gonna find out is that God's voice and his word and his commandments when he created the earth and then when he created Adam and Eve and when he told them like, hey, here's what I want you to do. We're gonna read about that. God set up his word, his voice, he set up his ways and he used his voice, his word to set up his ways in the hearts of his created people and said, here's my standards. I want you to follow these standards because this is the best way of life for you. And if you'll follow this, it's the best life you can have. My ways, I want them to be your ways. These standards, I want them to be your standards. But the voice of the enemy, the voice of Satan comes in and he changes this idea of standard and he changes the idea of God, what God said. And I want you to lean in and kind of hear about this. Here's what I want us to kind of look and lean into today is that 
As much as we heard last week, God's first words, here's the first words that we're going to now lean in and see what it is that, that we're going to hear from him. And it's in chapter 3, verse 1. I want to start it. This is what it says, um, and, and, and this is what I want us to grab a hold of to find out, okay, whose voice are we listening to? How do we know what that voice is of evil, of Satan, and what he's trying to say? Here's what his voice says, first recorded in all of Scripture. It says, uh, the setup is this. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. This is what he said. Ready? Here you go. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Okay, that's the very first thing that we see that God says. And the first thing that we read about Satan's voice, the enemy's voice or evil's voice, is that evil Satan himself is cunning. Okay, he is cunning. That the enemy of our soul is cunning. What does this word kind of imply? What does it mean? It means something I think really, really important. That he is clever, and that there is a portion of his approach that is smarter than you, okay? Evil is smarter than you. Satan is smarter than you. And he's got a clever way of getting his voice into your heart, into your life, into your choices, into your habits. And he's sneaky about it. He's clever about it. And if you could spot it, then it wouldn't be clever, okay? Like the definition of clever means you can't see it on your own. You won't identify it on your own. You need the reflection of God's word. You need God's truth. You need God's honesty. You need God's community of people that, that you allow to look in and peer in at your honest heart and thoughts and opinions. You need that so that you can go, oh, they are mirroring God's truth and word so that you can't isolate yourself from a community of people or God's voice the community of God's voice and God's people, God's truth. So that's where you're able to hear feedback of the stuff that you're like, I think this and this is what I'm thinking and this is what I want. Well, he's too clever for you to do it on your own. He is too clever for you to think you could just hunker down, isolate yourself into your own thoughts, into your own ways, into your own actions and just self actualize, just make it all good because you're just that good. You're not that good. And right now, if you're thinking like, no, no, he's not that clever. I've got it. I've got him beat. I can do this. You need to know that if you think you are outsmarting the enemy of your heart, if you're outsmarting Satan, you do not know how caught up you probably are today. His very first words say to us, did God really say? And this identifies his approach in verse one, that he's cunning. That means he is tricky and he wants to try to snap the idea of what we have learned about God and God's goodness and that he's trustworthy. The first thing he comes in is the very first thing, and you could write this down or type this in, the very first thing that Satan will always do to your heart, to your mind, to your life, is he wants to create doubt. Satan wants to create doubt in your heart about God's goodness. He wants you to doubt God's goodness. That is his desire is, ah, uh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, God said this. This is what God wanted. He, he said, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't eat from anything in the tree. It's like, did God really, did God really say? So he places doubt inside of our heart and our mind. This is how you can identify the voice of the adversary is, you will begin to question the standards of God's word and God's voice and God's heart and God's wisdom. You're like, I don't know. I don't know. Because really what happens is, is he comes and says, I'd like to replace God's standards and God's ways and God's words in your heart with, um, well, your ways and what I think is better. And I'd like you to listen to me. And, and that's really what he's hunting. He's hunting the fall. It's called the fall of man. The fall of man is where God used to be on the throne of God, of, of, of mankind's heart. And eventually this conversation comes in and introduces like, no, 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 did God really say that? Hold on a second. I don't know. Is that even what he really said? So he starts with saying like, I don't know. Is that what he said? Come on. Now, verse two leads us into kind of, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Verse two, the woman said to the serpent, uh, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. And so right away we see that he says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? That's verse one. You must not eat from any tree. So he now gets Eve, he gets, he gets her into a discussion of like, oh, no, 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 you got that wrong. I want to clarify this for you. It's not any tree. It's just the one tree in the middle of the garden. So she's like, no, 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 serpent. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, so she now is going to go and speak what God's word is. This is crucial to understand for those of 
of you who are followers of God, of God's ways, if you believe in Jesus and the way of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, like this is important for you to be able to hear because there's something that we believe about the power of God's word, right? We learned that last week. God's word has power. We believe in its power. And we see here that Eve speaks God's word back to Satan. So she uses the power of God's word to speak it to Satan. But this right here is why I believe it's so important for us to understand what's really going on. Watch what, but God did say, verse three, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. So she counters the voice of Satan. She says, here's the truth. You've tried to twist the truth. You've tried to get at me to feel like, oh, God's just this dictator God. You can't eat any tree. No, we can eat all the trees, uh, but just this one. He just said, just don't do that one. But everything else is totally cool. So now she's in a discussion and, and this is how it begins. It's like, I wanna lure you in because I've got something I wanna do. So he's cunning, he's sneaky. He's asking a doubtful question. Did God really say, no, that's not what God said. And now she answers back with God's word. But here's why we believe in our city church so much in there and then. The reason we care about there and then, the reason I want you to know what's happening in this story, the reason I want you to know what this means and what happened last week, and I want you to go back and listen to last week's message so you understand the context of today's message. The reason I want you to grasp what God's voice sounds like versus what the enemy's voice sounds like and understand, hey, this is what's going on in this story is because if you don't understand what God's word has to say, then the enemy can twist it against you just like he's trying to do here with Eve. He tries to actually say what God's word is, what God had to say, but twist it just enough where you go, oh, okay, well, I guess that's cool. And this is a tactic of him for people of belief is he gets us to not understand or to tweak it or to use it and attack us, to use it to attack others. And this is the broken approach that he uses now. This is where he comes and he introduces the second part. The first part is doubt God's goodness. That's the first thing he wants to do. He wants you to doubt God's goodness. But the second thing is in verse four, it says this, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. Verse five, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will know good and evil. There's truth and not truth all within the same thing. So the first thing he does is get us to doubt, did God really say? And the second thing that he says, uh, that he gets us to do is he wants us to contra he wants to contradict what God's word does say. He wants to contradict God's voice in your life. He wants to contradict God's goodness and say, uh, that's not gonna happen. That's not, no, that's not true. That's not like, that's not how that plays out. First things, you should probably think again about how good God is because I don't think God's as good as you think he is. So let's just start there. Second thing, um, I don't think that that's even, it's not gonna be that bad. No big deal. Don't trip, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. In fact, you'll end up being like God. You will be like God. Truer words were never spoken. You do become God when you choose to go your way, your route. And that's what is the fall of our, our, our nature, our human nature, our fallen nature is where we go from trusting in God's goodness to seizing control of it for ourselves and saying, I don't trust your goodness, so I'm gonna take over decision-making around here and make sure that I do what is good for me. The problem is that there's a dark side to us there's this other side to our hearts and our souls that we're introduced with that that is called sin and selfishness and it really breaks down all of humanity from this moment forward and and so we see that God's word and what he says is challenged by Satan. And this is why I think we have to really be able to hear this. What is the sound of God's voice? What does he say? Last week we learned he says, let there be light. That is good. If in your life, you are having a hard time speaking life over the dark areas, speaking light over the empty areas, speaking light over the unformed areas of whatever is in your life. You need to know that the clever one has gotten sneaky in your own heart. You may not have saw when it happened. You maybe didn't know when it did, but I want you to know the way you can tell that the voice of God is not the one that you are listening to like Eve was not listening to in this discussion is how you respond, how you respond to the darkness, how you respond to the emptiness and to the unformed part. And when he can come along and go, hey, 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 I want, I want to talk about this. Is God really that good? And what are you doing right now? Are you, are you speaking life? Are you speaking light? Are you able to be a conduit of God to create things? Or 
Is there something else you're doing within the context? Because the only thing that the enemy can do is bring death. He can't bring life. He brings an artificial version of joy and fun, but it's only for a moment, only so he can put his hooks in you and control and destroy and cause death and, and wreak havoc in your life. So he's like, no, nah, you're not going to die. You'll be fine. Why? Because he wants control. He wants you to break down. He wants you destroyed. He can't stand you because you reflect the image of God uh, be, be before mankind. That's your created function. So I want you to hear that you can tell whose voice you're listening to based on how you respond when your sin, sinful behavior, when your broken choices, when the things you do that are evil, at any scale of evil, you would say great evil, small evil. When you do evil, when you do selfish, when you do wrong, when you do things that are not right, that your inside voice of go, oh, that's not right. I know it. How you respond when God asks you or when your conscience asks you, when you hear conviction from what I believe the Bible teaches is the Holy Spirit of God, when he comes and goes, hey, hey, I'm tapping on your heart. That wasn't cool. That's not okay. How you respond really begins to dictate whose voice has got control in your life. And I want you to hear that because this is how it goes. Down, uh, sc Scroll on down to uh, verse 10. In verse 10, God comes, okay, he goes looking for them. They eat from the tree. Sin takes root. They choose to be God instead of listening to God's ways. They're like, nope, I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what God said. I'm going to do really what Satan said I could do is I can do it the way he has invited me to do it. Now, all of a sudden, there's this like awareness of their brokenness. There's this awareness of their sin. They feel shame. They feel the results of their selfish and sinful choices. And, and we believe in a, a, the ideas of this, of sin being born into our nature that we're all born sinners and we get better at it the longer we're alive. And so we see this happen where it gets into their heart. The same thing we do when we do something wrong, they do. They go looking to cover themselves up and then God comes through and he answers and he talks to them and he asks them like, hey, where are you? God asks them, where are you? And this is in verse 10, what, um, what, what uh, Adam answers and says. He says, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. Wow, circle that if you have that in your Bible. I was afraid because I was naked and so so I hid. Right away, we see the introduction of behavior that we feel the desire to do when we make our sinful, shameful mistakes. We, first of all, we feel afraid. We feel insecure. We feel anxiety. We feel this, 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 this sense of, 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 of accountability to some idea of what I could or should or needed to do. And, and that is, I think, the, the, the evidence of a God uh, created desire to do what God calls us to. And when we feel that, we're like, ooh, I feel that. I feel this thing. And it's like, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. To those of you that battle a grand sense of fear and insecurity, I want to tell you that this is how you can identify you might be living out and acting out of things that the enemy is whispering in your ear. It doesn't mean you don't know God. It doesn't mean you don't walk with God. It just means that you have not paid attention to the cunning, sneaky voice of your enemy, your adversary, and he is trying to find a way to get your actions to mix in part of what God said and part of what he wants you to say, part of what God said and part of what he wants you to feel like you're in control of. It's the blending and mixing he's trying to do. And in this space, that's what will make you feel afraid. We are insecure. We do feel unstable. We, sh we will have anxiety when we're living not out of the voice that God says, let there be light, let there be, uh, let there be development, let there be creation, let me speak life to the unformed, the undeveloped, the things that aren't there. It's like, nope, all of a sudden that's not what happens and now I'm afraid, now I'm nervous, now I feel shame. And it says that when he heard God, when he knew God's truth was coming through, what did he do? Two major things. First thing he does is he becomes afraid. So there's a broken sense of how to respond to the feelings I feel that I've done something wrong. And he hides. So he hides. That's the first thing he does. He hides. So the very first thing we, we, we want to recognize is the two parts of we become afraid. We feel this distance, this disconnect between God. And it's like, gosh, this doesn't feel good. I don't like the way this feels. And we hide. We want to hide what we're doing. We want to either portray everything's fine. Cover up. Let me get some leaves. Things are cool. What? Nothing to see here. Everything's fine. Hey, how you guys doing? God bless you. You're doing good. Great. Oh, amen. And we're hiding what's going on inside. We're hiding who we really becoming. And that's how you know the clever one sneakily has gotten a hold of a part of your heart, a part of your life. And God doesn't want that for you. He doesn't. He has given himself as Jesus. Jesus came and he doesn't want that for you. And if you're living in that, I really think he's wanting to speak 
speak to you from the original story of how it all came to be. The first thing I want you to see is in verse 10 is that they hide. And he said, God answers to Adam when he sees that he's afraid, when he sees that he's got shame because of the disconnect and he's hiding. That means God knows, uh uh-oh, you listen to the voice of someone else. You listen to the adversary, to the enemy. Satan has gotten your voice. He's gotten his voice to be in your heart. And so God asks a direct question. He said, who told you that you were naked? Basically, how'd you figure out that you should feel insecure? How'd you figure out you should be afraid? Why are you afraid? You wouldn't be afraid. You wouldn't feel insecure. You wouldn't feel unstable. You wouldn't feel this much anxiety. Yes, there's a part of all those things that are just a part of some level of life, but the ramped up sense of that, the over like abundant amount of that is evidence that the voice of the cunning one the sneaky one, the one who despises you and all you represent has found a way to get into your heart and into your actions. And God will come upon your own world and say, Hey, who told you that? Who told you this? Like, that means you've done something that has illuminated you to this area of hiding, of shame, of, of being afraid and disconnected from me and my love. And he asks, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Have you done opposite of what I asked? I I, I gave you what I said. Did you forget I was good? Did you not believe I was good? Did you think that like I was not to be trusted? Did you believe God doesn't know what's best for me? God doesn't have what's best for me. I don't believe his goodness anymore. It's not going to happen. This has been too hard, too painful, too difficult. I'm doing it my own way and began to just say, I'm gonna do it, only to find that that is more devastating and it's more disconnecting and it invites more anxiety and more fear and more self-hate and more disillusionment and more disappointment and more disconnect from the very people in your own life that you love. It's like, it doesn't get better and Satan knows it and so many of us are living in that, not knowing that the reason why is because the whisperer of old, the sneaky whisperer is whispering his voice right on into your heart and every day he comes for you again and again. And if we don't learn how to identify when we are living out and functioning from a place of hearing his voice versus hearing God's voice and being used by God to speak God's voice versus being used by Satan to speak the things he wants into the people around us, then we will be totally at the whims of the brokenness that Satan has for us. And this is where we see it. We see that he says, um, have you eaten from the tree that I command you not to eat from? Now, verse 12, this is where we see the second part. Okay, first part is that when we are when we identify that we've done something broken, when we violated our, 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 our desire to trust God and we've become our own God, we've done our own decision-making, we don't want God to be God, we want to be God, and now sin gets in our hearts, selfishness gets in our hearts, and we're no longer speaking light, we're no longer speaking life, now it's just like death and darkness and the despair lasts, and there's doubt and there's contradiction of like what we say we believe versus how we're acting. And there's this disconnect. There's this cover up of leaves that looks all good, but it's really not what's going on in the heart. That's where you know Satan has grabbed a hold of me and you and all of us. This right here is how you can tell the second part we do. The first thing we do is we hide. The second thing we do is exactly what they do. Have you eaten? And verse 12, the man said, the woman you put here. Okay, let's just start there, God. All right, I didn't put her here. I didn't, it, hey, you done put Eve here. Okay, so the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree. And, you know, I mean, I ate it or whatever. I mean, you know, that, a little bit of part of me, right? Isn't that immediately how we see how we all act? We hide and ready. Here's how you know that you're listening to the voice of Satan and, 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 and God is trying to get through to you right now is, how you respond when your actions are called upon. You hide and you blame. That's the human behavior when we are confronted with our own evil choices, when we're confronted with our own brokenness. We hide, then we blame. Now, the woman you put here with me, okay? She's the one that did all this, and that's the reason why I'm sinning. That's the reason why I ate. That's the reason why I'm dealing. This is the why. It's her. Don't you understand? God, and by the way, I'm a little bit kind of like making sure you kind of keep the picture here. You did it, God. You put her here. I didn't, I'm not the one, you know, like what? What do you want from me, God? I don't know. This is where you see human nature. It's in you and it's in me. And it's how you can tell that God's voice is trying to get through to you, but Satan's voice is 
controlling too much of your heart, too much of your life, too much of your decision making, too much of your soul is when you start to say, I want to hide and I want to blame. Then he continues on and he goes, okay, so the Lord God said to the woman, it's like, well, I'm looking for a man. Adam don't want to stand up and be a man. Let's go see if the woman wants to actually like do what's right and be like, like the, what I commanded and created and what I want. It's like, wanted you to take responsibility? Nope. Let's go see if the woman will take responsibility. Ready? Let's be, let's be about this. So the Lord God said to the woman, uh, what is this thing you've done? And the woman said, it's the serpent, the snake deceived me. And I ate, hey, you don't understand the Satan guy is really Gosh, man, he just made it sound so good, God. Like, don't you get it? Like, it was really hard. I was having a bad day. It was really difficult. Like, whatever it is that goes on in our hearts and our minds that we excuse it, it's something else. It's a blame game. It's I want to hide and I want to blame. He's to blame. She's to blame. You're to blame. But I'm not. This is how you can tell it sneakily has gotten inside of all of us. And I want us to be able to grab a hold of this so we can hear because what we do is the opposite, okay? We do the opposite so often. God gives his standards and Satan wants to make God's standards preferences. Hey, these are God's standards, but you don't really need to worry about that. And did he even say, and I don't know if it's even me, that's what it means. And Satan will try to whisper his voice and make you just be like, ah, these are just preferences of God. When God's like, no, no, these are things that are best for you. These are my, this is wisdom. This is best. This is the way I want it to go. Walk in it. And I want us to be able to learn how to identify that in our own way. So there are a few thoughts I have for you. First of all, I want you to be able to understand that, that when you believe in God's goodness, you can trust God's standards. And I would say it this way, that God's standards should be our standards because God is good and God can be trusted. God can be trusted to be good for us. We don't need to listen into the voice of the one who goes, eh, I don't know, God's not good. And I don't think we need to really like let him be in so much control. Why don't we mix up a little bit of God, a little bit of you. I'm gonna tell you right now, a little bit of me and you mixed into the seat that God alone can manage is a broken life to have. And I wanna let you know today that you can pay attention to the way that you are speaking life and speaking um, light versus how you are allowing there to be this, 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 this blame or this hiding, whenever that, or even this isolation, right? Because that's what they do. They go in isolation and they don't have any of the, con the conversations they had previously had with God are done. Do you find yourself hiding? Do you find yourself blaming? Right now, listen, listen, listen. Right now, are you literally thinking of someone else who you wish was listening to this right now? Because if you're doing that, you're doing the same thing that they did when God was talking to them. Same exact thing. And it's in our nature. This is how you know it's in your nature. We all do this because this is where I believe God wants us to be able to understand. Look, I want you to trust my goodness and I want you to be able to do my standards. And I want you, listen, I want you to be able to be used by me to speak light, to speak life over people, not to introduce doubt or contradiction and not to hide and not to blame. Are you finding yourself blaming other people for your reactions, your responses, your words, your silence, you going into isolation? Are you finding yourself doing what they did is I want to cover up, I want to hide, I want to blame, and I'm going to isolate myself from God. I'm going to isolate myself from the community of God and the, 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 the whole entire entity of God like or and his church, his the relationship with others. Like I don't want anyone to tell me anything about my behavior. I don't want anyone asking me questions about these fig leaves. Don't they look good? Don't I look good? Come on, there's nothing to see here. Like this right here, if this behavior is something you're finding in your own heart, friends, the honest truth is, is that you are acting exactly like someone who has fallen prey to the clever, sneaky voice of your enemy, the adversary, Satan himself. He has gotten you. He has whispered to your heart. He has sneakily got in there and got you to blame someone else for your own actions and to hide from the God who wants to set you free. God loves you. He sent Jesus to cover all the mistakes. He says, you don't need to hide. You don't need to run. I want to forgive you, but I also want you to do right. I want you to do good. I want you to speak life. I want you to speak to the depths. I want you to speak to the darkness. I want you to speak to the emptiness, which you cannot do if you're too busy making fig leaf jackets, 
fig leaf clothes, if you're too busy running in isolation. Listen, if you're in isolation, then you're always right. You're always true. You're always doing right and good and perfect and everything is as you say it is. But when you get into community and you actually really let someone find out about what you've done, then all of a sudden it's like there's a conversation like there was with God. It's like, hey, did... Um, Cool, I totally heard your story. Your version is, you were afraid, you slept in, you wanted to hide. This is what they did, I get it, she did that. But God comes in and brings healthy community, healthy accountability accountability, and says, um, real quick, I know I heard your I heard your version. Here's my question: Did um, did you do this though? Is is that because that right there, God doesn't want you doing that, and that's broken, and it's going to lead you to hide and blame, cover up and blame, because covering up and blaming is how we always deal with our shame. That's what we do when we, we cover up and we blame when we feel like the, the the sin and the shame in our own hearts. And and this is something that I think God wants to illuminate in us, especially during this quarantine time where I, I read the comments last week. So many of you are asking for prayer in your marriages, your relationships, your parenting, all this stuff. Listen, so much of the conflict going on in your homes right now is a direct result of it being invisible to you when you are listening to the voice of the one who is just like, hey, go and just let it fly and don't you understand and it's really hard and you don't need to apologize. I'm going to tell you right now, sinning is a part of life. This is not the problem. Your sin, I want to say this, you sinning is not really the problem. Here's the problem because Jesus took care of the problem at the cross. We believe, those of us that are believers in Jesus, believe Jesus rose, rose from the dead, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and then invites you into being forgiven through a relationship with him so that perfect God views you through perfect Jesus and says, you're perfect in your standing in in, in Jesus, you're fine. So, So your sin is not the problem. Here's your problem. Your problem is when you hide from the God who wants to cover you. When you cover up and you blame everything else and you don't take accountability and you don't take ownership for the broken things that are happening in your life. This is where we need to be able to identify this. Now, next week, I want to talk uh, at, you know, a lot more about this. I really want to speak about the standards and the preferences, like the things that the enemy does. I, we do the reverse of it. And I'm going to continue this discussion next week. So please, I, I come back next week. I want to discuss, like, what does it mean for us? How do we practically do this? Because I'm going to tell you right now, so often there are standards that God says, hey, these are standards and we want to make them preferences. But then we do the reverse also. In our day-to-day relationships, we go in and and there's this idea that we mix up that stuff when it comes to the people around our lives. And I want to talk about that last uh, next week. But for, for today, here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to really consider what does it sound like for you right now when you recognize the things that you have done that are broken? And listen, if, if you don't think that you're doing broken stuff, then that level of, of deception that Satan has for you is very powerful in your life. And the first thing you need to wake up to is that every day you sin and everyone has to deal with my sin, your sin every day. Okay, so this is what I want us to be able to look at. Not that we sin. I, I hope that that's answered. Yes, we do. We do broken stuff. Here's what I want us to be able to answer. How do we sound when we're confronted with our sin? How do we respond? Are you hiding and running from God's goodness and his grace and his offer and availability of forgiveness through Jesus? That he says, I want to forgive you and I want to help you and you don't need to run and hide. Number one. Number two, are you blaming either God or blaming others for your actions and saying, no, skip that. Don't you see what she did? Don't you see God? I don't, what are you asking me for? Why don't you ask her? Why don't you ask him? Like, don't you see? Apparently you weren't there when he and when she and when they, and you don't understand it's saying fair. Listen, that posture is a posture that is still unwilling to be honest. It's unwilling to be in front of God's love and his truth. And it's covering up and it's hiding and it's dealing with shame in a sinful way instead of a forgiven way, instead of a whole way, instead of a healthy way. God wants to invite you not to run in sin and shame and blame. He wants to invite you to come into wholeness and forgiveness and to be transparent and honest. This last week, uh, my wife and I were meeting with a couple in our church um, and just talking with them, socially distant, of course. And uh, one of the things that was really cool, and I won't say if it was the husband or the wife, but the, the, the principle I thought was so powerful was as they spoke about how things were going and whatnot, one of said, you know, one of the things I recognize is that I can flash from like a one to a 10 emotionally and just almost kind of lose my my train of thought. And just they know there's going to be some irrational stuff that gets said uh, for the next couple minutes until I kind of like find my bearings. And it was interesting to be able to hear someone go, I'm not 
I am not blaming and I'm not hiding. I am bringing my honest sin right inside of a community of loving people who can be honest with me and care. So instead of portraying, nope, good, nope, nail it, great. It's like, I so don't want this to trail me the rest of my life. I don't want this to be a part of my life that I wanna own it, I wanna speak to it, I wanna say it, I wanna name it and I'm not gonna hide and I'm not going to blame. See, this right here allows for God's humility to rise, for the power of God and forgiveness because this is the thing that we can offer to people. If you would this week offer, not a perfect life, that's not real, but when we fail, when we miss it, be able to say, hey, this right here, I totally missed it and I do that. And that's a part of being my friend, of working with me, of being my son, of being my daughter, of being my husband, of being my wife, of, of being my boss. Like that's, a, that's going to be a part of your reality by virtue of your proximity to me. And I just wanna say, man, that, that's that. If we can learn to name that, then that is reverse of what Satan got Adam and Eve to do in this conversation with God. That's the reverse of isolating ourselves and saying, nope, ship shape, everything's fine, I don't know. And by the way, while you're looking for stuff to talk about people doing wrong, have you thought about her, him, and them, and all these people? It's like, no, 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 God, you, you gotta take care of that. For me, I, I wanna work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I, I wanna work out what's going on between me and you. I don't want that disconnect to last, and I know it will last, and it will own me, and it will grip me, and it will command me if I don't bring it before your truth and your community and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. I, I don't wanna hide it and I don't wanna blame it. I, I wanna name it and it's hard and it's difficult to be humble, but that's the power of what we believe is that in the humility of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that's where the power of freedom and the power of forgiveness, but the power of the resurrection comes and say, well, that death of your pride, that death and humility is where life springs up. And that's where wholeness and, and, and all of the healthy things we want in our connected relationship with God and each other, that's where it really begins to take shape. I, I want you to put that to practice this week. I, I wanna invite you this week, can we not be perfect, but can can we name it and not hide it and not blame it and not excuse it away, but say, this right here is something that I, I think I introduced to this, 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 this relationship. This is what I introduced to this job. This, I, I kind of made this happen this, this week and that's the way I came across it. And I need to say that and name that. If we would just this week, allow for us to do that. It will change whose voice is in control of us. And now it's like, okay, God, I'm bringing light because humility like that really shines the brightness of God's life, his light on the dark areas of our, our homes, our relationships, our lives. And I can tell you right now, in this season of quarantine where we've just been close to each other for so much, we've said more stuff than we should have said, we've done more stuff than we should have done, and we've hurt more feelings and it's been like that. Listen, 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 listen. Don't give the devil, don't give Satan a chance to ruin relationships between you and God and you and others. Put a stop to his voice, silence his attack, say, no, I refuse to hide, I refuse to blame, because when I hide and blame, you're in control and you're running things. I wanna push back against that in God's power, in God's name, and that's what I wanna pray for you today. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we invite God to help us do this activity so we can put a silence and a stop to the working voice of our adversary today. God, uh, man, I just so desire in my heart and in the heart of our church and everyone watching today for us to experience true freedom from the attack of Satan, the attack of the enemy who comes in and especially in these stressful, very quarantined, tight quarters, you know, different rhythm, different, seeing each other so much. There, there's so many more probable arguments and hurt feelings and disagreements, but God, pride would have us stay hunkered down hiding, isolating, not letting anyone else hear about like our own brokenness and blaming. And God, we don't want that because that's when we know we're functioning from how Satan wants us to act with you and with those that we are in relationship with. That's what Satan wanted for Adam and Eve and you and Adam and Eve and with each other. But we don't want that. So God, we reject that idea. We reject those thoughts. We reject those lies. We reject those doubts. We reject that contradiction of what you've commanded and asked of us. And God, we wanna speak now what we learned last week, life. We wanna speak to the darkness and to the empty, God, and to the unformed. And God, we don't want to hide and blame God, we wanna speak honesty to our brokenness and invite you and community to be honest about it. And God, when we do that, we break and sever the connection and the power of the voice of our adversary. And we believe in your goodness and we believe in your grace and we believe in forgiveness. 
But God, we believe in the power of transparency. We believe in the power of owning and admitting. And God, that's what I believe you were looking for in Adam and Eve. And in Jesus, we have the power to do that. It will be hard, it isn't easy, but it's where we really feel the connection to you and to the ones that we are in love relationship with. Would you remove the lies and the trap of the enemy right now in Jesus' name, God? I ask that you would sever the, the power that he is working over so many lives that, God, that they feel defeated and hopeless during this quarantine season. God, I ask right now that you would literally reach into the hearts of people listening and watching this, God, and cause them to pause and to stop and let pride be silent. Silence pride sever pride. God, dismantle our pride. Break it down. And God, may brokenness and humility, those powerful tools in the hand of our God, rise right now inside of our souls. And God, may we remove the, the tools of hiding and blaming today, right now, God, and make things right so that the life that you want to speak, the light you spoke with the very first words you ever said, can begin to take shape in our souls and hearts today. I pray this over our church and our friends and ask your word to make itself known in these ways. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, next week I wanna talk a lot more about God's standards um, versus some of our preferences. And I wanna talk about some of our preferences versus uh, standards. And I think it's gonna be powerful, especially in the shifting ideas of what is right, what is good, what does it all mean, please. Join us next week. Uh, I really think it's going to be a powerful weekend. I love you. Enjoy the rest of your day tomorrow as well. Share this video with somebody. Pastor Kellen's going to say it too, but I want to make sure there are people that need to be encouraged and they need to be illuminated to the voice of God and the voice of their adversary so they can walk in freedom and not be bound anymore. Come on, let's help people get free. I love you, Our City. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for such an inspiring message today. And hey, before you guys go, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, turn on notifications for any future content, and make sure you share this video with a friend or two. And parents, if you're looking for some resources, you can go to our website, check out YouTube, check out Instagram and Facebook, where we have resources for the youth and kids as well. Well, hey, we hope you have a great week, and as always, let's change the world together.
Thank you.